Well, it's so cool to be back for my second time here. Um, woo yes, last year I spoke on suicide, which if you missed that, go back, watch it. There's some good info in that as well. Um, and you get to see if I made any progress from that time speaking to this time. But, <laughs> but anyways, um, so yeah, my name's Katie and I am a licensed medical social worker. So working on the LC, almost got it. Licensed clinical social worker will be my title in a couple weeks. But for now, I'm just going to say I'm MSW, which is a uh, Master of Social Work. So I do have my degree in social work, um, and I got it in 2016. And funny enough, when I first got out of grad school, there were two populations that I told myself, I am never going to work in that ever again. One of them was I never wanted to work with folks who were unhoused or homeless, because in my mind, I was like, well... You know, I kind of have like cleanliness issues and like, you know, hygiene and I don't think I can handle it. So that was one population. And the second population was people struggling with addiction. Um, and God definitely have a, has a sense of humor with that one, <laughs> as I will soon discuss. But, but yeah, this topic is one that's very important. I think a lot of us who grow up in homes, whether you know, you grew up in a believing household or not, um, you know, I think it's really important to understand that our emotions are God-given and that a lot of the addiction that's out there, honestly, we all have it. It's not just, you know, people out there doing heroin on the street or snorting coke. It's, it's everywhere. I mean, screens, right? How many of us have a phone that we're like glued to? I know I am for whatever good, good reason it is, you know. Duolingo, I say that because I'm like trying to learn Spanish and on Duolingo all the time. Facebook, whatever it is, we're all on a screen. And then, you know, you go to things like alcohol. People, you know, that's a socially acceptable drug for many households. And they grow up in different cultures, you know, drink more or um, are more acceptable in certain cultures. Um, and yeah, there's all kinds of things. Shopping, I mean... When I tell my story, I'll be the first to admit that my addictive tendencies began with shopping <laughs> many years ago. I learned that, hey, if I'm feeling upset, if I just buy this, I'm going to feel great for about a day. And, you know, that kind of <laughs> took off, and that's an addiction I'm still working on. But that's a whole other story for another time. So let's see here if I can figure this out. Okay, cool. So today and... Bear with me, I switched the first two slides. But first, I'm going to go over the fear of feeling. And then I'm going to talk about my story, um, talk a little bit about addiction. I'm not going to bore you guys with all the details about addiction. If you're as much of a nerd as I am, you can go ahead and research it yourself. Um, because trust me, I've researched it a lot. And yeah, um, the emotion connection. So why I'm talking about emotions in the context of addiction the fact that emotions are God-given. So I'll provide a couple of verses that, to me, really speak to that even in biblical times, which, you know, the Bible is a living document, um, you know, that even, even then that emotions have been a thing and there's something that everyone can relate to. And then feeling our feelings. You guys see the colorful little wheel on your or circle on the paper in front of you, definitely take that home with you. I'll tell you more about what it means and how to use it. Um, but that's a great tool to use in your family as well as even with kids. I'm not a parent, by the way. I always preface this with that. Um, but I am a sister and I'm an aunt now and I'm a daughter. So I have many other different relationships um, and titles. And then how to encourage your child to feel their feelings. And then I'll have some time for questions at the end. Okay, so the first slide is basically a bunch of questions. And I know that font is super small. So let me read them out for you. And with these questions, I'm just going to give you maybe like 30 seconds, a minute to talk amongst yourselves if you feel comfortable. And then I will just ask someone if they want to share so the first question, and all you guys can pick any or all of these. Um, number one, what were you taught about feelings growing up? So again, what were you taught about feelings growing up? And then number two, 
How did your family of origin handle emotions such as anger, sadness, and worry? How did your family of origin handle emotions such as anger, sadness, and worry? How did your family of origin respond to tears and crying? How did your family of origin respond to tears and crying? What were you taught about happiness? What were you taught about happiness? And lastly, were there any emotions that were labeled as bad, so bad emotions, or off limits for you to feel? So again, were there any emotions that were labeled as bad or off limits, like you couldn't feel them? So just think about those for a minute and maybe discuss one or if you guys have one that you prefer to talk about. Um, yeah, just discuss amongst yourselves for like 30 seconds. All right. If I could have just one or two people just volunteer to share maybe what you talked about at your table or if someone feels comfortable just sharing their experience growing up, what they were taught about feelings. Anybody? I'm going to look at mom and dad if no one else does. So someone please raise your hand. Yes. So for me, it was kind of a mixed bag. Yeah, things are okay. It's good to express your feelings. It's don't feel hurt. Don't, don't feel proud of yourself. Because pride is wrong. Don't feel... Don't get too angry. You know, things like that. So it's kind of like a weird Thank you. Yeah, good point about how it's, you know, again, separating. Like, okay, you can feel this, but if it's too much, you know, then that's not okay. Anyone else want to share this? Yes. <laughs> don't laugh too much, you'll cry. Wow. I mean, I, I personally, when I laugh too much, I love to cry. Because that means you're laughing hard. <laughs> but yeah, very interesting, you know. Some families, that, that is, like, you know, tears, especially, I know, in some families are very kind of off limits. Like, we don't show that type of emotion. So, thank you. Anybody else? We'll have to take one more if someone wants to volunteer. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Okay, so as we can tell, just even by the people that shared their experiences, we all come from very different families where feelings were expressed very differently. Certain things were acceptable, certain things were not acceptable. Um, and certain things were unspoken, some were spoken. So it just kind of speaks to the diversity and um, you know to the broad amount of experiences people can have with their families that they grew up with. So a little bit about my story, and I chose two photos where I have long hair because I'm trying to grow my hair long again. <laughs> so you know, kind of hoping it's like, hey God, you know, my hair. But. Um, <laughs> But anyways, so I put a little blurb on here, but I've always been a very deeply feeling person um, in a world that I have since growing up realized does not really glorify feeling. If anything, our society kind of glorifies numbing the feelings. Um, and so it wasn't long before when I was very young, probably around the age of, I mean, starting at like five, I can remember being upset and then going to my lovely grandma and grandpa's house, who I love to death and who unfortunately are no longer with us, but they were the spoiling grandparents. I was very blessed to have grandparents that spoiled me and my sister rotten. And to that effect, I learned very fast that Oh, if I, if my grandma buys me this beanie baby, or as I got older, if grandma buys me this purse, wow, I feel like high, for lack of better words, I feel like better about myself than if I hadn't gotten this. And you know, that high, high would last maybe what a day until I realized there was something else I wanted because you know, consumer, all <laughs> capitalism, whatever. Um, but you know, it's, it's a true thing. It got me realizing that I can change how I feel if I buy something. 
So fast forward many, many years, um, I, you know, I did the typical college thing, drink in college, not saying that should be typical, but it was typical where I was at. Um, drink before college too, but we're not going to talk about that because my parents are in the room. Um, and uh, yeah, so did some of that, but thankfully I never really got into anything that would get me too much in trouble, except in 2018 when I started going through kind of a rough time, I just started dating someone kind of new who wasn't that great for me. Um, and then I also lost my job because I was prioritizing the relationship. So I was in what I would call a vulnerable state for me. And, you know, vulnerability looks different for everybody. But if I could have told you or if you would have told me back in 2018 that I would become addicted to something, I would have been like, OK, you're the addict because you're smoking something like it's not me. But but it was um, I became addicted to cocaine and I started doing cocaine in February of 2018. And it was very it literally was one night. That's all it took. Someone putting it in front of me and saying, hey, do you want to try it? And I was like, you know what? Life's pretty crappy right now, in my opinion, back then. Um, but, you know, why not? I'll try it. And I did. And that was all it took. One night, and I found myself going down a very deep rabbit hole that I had no idea how long it would even take to get myself out of it. Um, and again, the thing that was unique about cocaine for me and why I'm sharing this is because I had always struggled with feeling low. Like, I struggled with depression growing up. I struggled with suicidal thoughts. I struggled with all that stuff. So when I found this substance that suddenly like lifted my mood and I felt confident and I felt like I could do anything and my worries like I didn't care yeah I have something going on in my life but who cares because I've got cocaine that's the kind of mentality that I got into so um you know again this is just me saying it can happen to anybody I think we all have this idea that people who um, are addicted to anything are just the folks that are maybe unhoused on the streets that, you know, oh, they just, they've been doing this their whole life, or oh, they chose this, or oh, whatever, you know, but, but no, no one chooses. The way that a drug and alcohol counselor said to me once, no one is playing their sandbox as a kid and dreams of being an addict. It's just how it is. And again, for me, cocaine, that was what I used to change how I felt for nearly five years. Um, and I actually recently had my one year sober, so that is amazing. Thank you, everyone. And but that that took like four, four and a half years to get pretty much. So again, and I'm lucky I had access to resources. But but I bring that up because, again, the only reason why cocaine in particular really did it for me was because it totally changed how I felt. I wasn't is that I wasn't down I wasn't anything I was just high and it's the same for a lot of folks that self-medicate with other things I think it's the same for people who even don't medicate but who use something to change how we feel you know tv video games name it I mean out in you know in youth like we're hearing all kinds of things tiktok like I mean, I'm technically a millennial and I still don't really understand how to use TikTok, but uh, you know, you do. And it's just one of those things that, you know, as we continue with technology, which is definitely becoming more of an addiction for more and more people. I mean, no one can put their phones down. No one can even have a conversation except over Facebook Messenger or Instagram Messenger anymore. Um, and that's, that's just sad. <laughs> So today I want to talk about emotions in particular because we all have some kind of addiction or thing or something that we use to take the edge off or at the end of the day tell ourselves, oh, I'm so stressed, I just need a glass of wine. That's still changing how you feel. So that's why I'm talking about emotions and that's a little bit of the context. Um, but yeah, I'm just asking for an open mind and hopefully, you know, everyone will come out of here just with some ideas even of how to feel our feelings and show our kids, show our family that it's okay too.
So pick your poison. I picked, you know, and I got to say, I, I, I don't know how. I mean, clearly I'm in denial about my, my caffeine addiction because I forgot to put caffeine up there. And that's definitely one that I have now. So, but this is just a few examples. Again, pick your poison. Like for me up there, it was the bag, you know, the bag of cocaine. And honestly, with the exception of cocaine, not everything on this screen is bad, right? We see things on this screen that many of us just use on day-to-day -day life. For example, like the screens, I'm sure everyone, well, a lot of youth in particular, have laptops that they're on at late hours of the night, watching whatever. We don't necessarily want to know what they're watching. But there's that. There's exercise and over-exercising. You know, anything can be not good if it's not done in moderation. Well, cocaine's just not good. <laughs> no moderation for that. And, you know, shopping, um, pain medicine, even, you know, prescriptions, it's all, it can all be something for the right someone, um, you know, depending on what works for them or does it for them. Okay, so this is going to be my boring slide. So basically, a little bit about addiction. It's a biopsychosocial thing, which in social work fancy terms just mean it comprises like our entire aspect of self. You know, it's got a biological component. So addiction, tendencies, whatever, can run in the family. So oftentimes there's a genetic link of some kind. Um, and, and I think it's important for people to know that, for kids to know that about their families because then they can have that education, like, oh, this runs in my family, and really kind of be more cautious. So I definitely think that that's important. Um, some people are just more susceptible to addiction. It just is what it is. Again, could be genetics, could just be a variety of things, their environment growing up. Um, and then there's, of course, dopamine, which that's the motivation and the pleasure neurotransmitter. So the way that I was described um, by someone with cocaine in particular is that kind of like when you go to the fair and they have that thing that you hit and then something shoots right up um, and like lights up and all that, kind of like that with cocaine. So you figure, I do cocaine, suddenly, you know, my dopamine like shoots up and it's all colorful and fun and fast. And then it comes back down. What goes up must come back down. And when it does, like, you know, the release of dopamine, we feel pleasure, we feel good things. But then as soon as it's down, suddenly we're back in pain, suddenly we're back in this emotional, just kind of like blahness. Um, and I bring this up because, you know, they've done studies even with things like sugar, even with things like, um, you know, video games, even things with screen time. Um, and like likes on Facebook and likes on Instagram. It's all the same thing. It's all the same idea. Granted, liking, having someone like your post on Instagram is not the same as doing a line of Coke, but I will say that they have similarities and that's important to recognize. Um, and then self-medication, a huge, I mean, probably one of the biggest commonalities that people who struggle with addiction or again, just any of those tendencies um, period is that there's an underlying issue um, with either mental health or again the emotion piece which we'll talk more about and then emotional dependence so that's the feeling of like I need this to like keep going and the thought of like well what is my life without cocaine what is my life without this video game what is life without name it so, um, so that's an important piece too, because it can also lead to people feeling, um, temporarily like there's nothing to live for. And that opens a whole other can of worms. Um, but you know, it's this idea that again, we can become so dependent on something that it ends up just without it. I mean, life just seems very monotonous. So our environment matters a lot. If we grew up in a place where, you know, alcohol, drug use was socially acceptable, obviously to us, that's going to feel acceptable. Same with screens. If we grew up, um, and this is obviously for a lot of kids growing up now, is that if they're growing up where screens are totally normal, it's going to be the same thing, you know, as they get older and for their kids. And it's just a generational thing. 
And so I definitely believe in like generational curses and curse breaking. And, you know, it's really important to also, you know, let also invite the Lord into that. Um, but again, that's, that's a whole other topic too. Um, and then peer pressure, we all hear about peer pressure. It's more of a drug and alcohol thing because I mean, when it comes to peer pressure to like play a video game, no one's really going to bat an eye at that. Some might, but you know, that kind of only applies for certain things. And then the big one, which again is what I'm focusing on is using outside substances or things to change how we feel. And this can go from as basic or as, you know, considered acceptable as again, Facebook likes or going on screen time, all the way to the top at doing something like fentanyl, which I have clients who literally do straight fentanyl. So, um, yeah, so that's my boring slide, <laughs> my boring slide and however long that took me. Um, so the emotion connection, again, I talk about the addiction piece and not even addiction, just like dependence or, um, you know, the feeling like you need these things to keep going. Um, because the truth is there are no good or bad emotions. And I think so many times we, we either labeled them as good or bad, our family of origin did, or we hear it in society. So um, I like to throw that one out there. And the purpose of emotion, every emotion has a purpose. So uh, my kind of how I see it and what my experience has been is that Emotions tell us something about ourselves. They tell us what's going on inside of us, and they tell us what's going on outside of us and other people and people we love. For example, um, there's been numerous studies that have shown that actually across cultures, there are only four emotions that are cross-culturally just recognized. Does anyone want to take a guess at what like one of them are? Anyone? Yes? What's another one? Yes, yeah, sad. Two. Let's see. No, actually, anger's not. No. No. So it's actually disgust, um, surprised, happy, and sad. Those are the four that are recognized cross-culturally. Anger, and I'll talk about anger because it's my favorite one to talk about, is a secondary reaction to a primary feeling. Okay. So this is, again, just a reminder before I go to the feelings wheel that our emotions are God-given. And in the Bible, I mean, there are so many passages that talk about the importance of, you know, be anxious for nothing and really to... Um, you know, they're the fruits of the Spirit and all kinds of references to that. But also, my kind of the one that I really like to focus on is the one of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. I think <laughs> I can never say right. Gethsemane. Gis Anyways, yes, that. <laughs> um, I love this because it says Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And then it says, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. That was Jesus. Like, that was the perfect man. And if I read this correct, it says, he was sorrowful and troubled. So, and he fell to the ground and prayed. And if I had to guess, probably cried. Because he said, Father, if it is possible may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So again, that's just showing like even, even people that we might not think would display emotion or that it's a bad thing. Um, you know, emotion, emotion's just human. That's really what it is. So feeling our feelings. So I printed out a copy of this for everyone because it's a way to identify what feelings you are experiencing, as well as a tool to bring home to your kids and anyone else who you think has a hard time feeling their feelings, um, and just really point out like the importance of feeling and recognizing what you're actually feeling. So the, the example that I like to use is anger. And if you look at anger, 
you figure when we're, you know, out in the world or whatever, we're usually just saying, I'm angry or I'm frustrated or I'm whatever. But as you can tell, there's so many different levels of anger. So one exercise that I do with my clients oftentimes in my therapy work is I will hear them say, I'm angry. And I will ask them, okay, where do you feel that in your body? Because oftentimes our body also remembers where either we experience trauma, where we experience someone telling us you can't feel that. Our body is very attuned to that as well. So I will have them say, okay, you tell me, you tell me you're angry. Where does that sit with you in your body? And when that happens, I have them recognize that. And then I'll take him to the second or the secondary level, which for anger is let down, humiliated, bitter, mad, aggressive, all that. But then I'll ask, what resonates with this? Does anything resonate with this? And if they say yes, like, you know, uh, I feel let down, then you go to the tertiary level, which says for that one, betrayed and resentful. And as you can tell, just even looking at this shows you that there are many different things that can be under anger and other things. And it also is a talking point, you know, when we have those conversations with family members, conversations that are difficult, conversations that make us wonder, like, how is someone feeling and how do I talk to them? really asking them, well, how do you feel? You know, it sounds so cliche, sounds like a therapy thing, and it is, but, you know, it's, it's a human thing. And the best way to support each other and support our kids is to actually know what they're thinking and feeling. So I bring up that because, again, I think it's a great tool to be able to bring home and also to take away from, you know, if they are on the screen or whatever, to start setting like a routine for this. Um, Because again, a lot of times, especially in families where we're silenced for what we think or feel, you know, this opens up that door to be able to say what they're feeling and what they're thinking. And from there, they may not even need to feel the need to numb whatever they're feeling with whatever or change how they're feeling because we're all going to feel like that's, it's a human thing. And I remember um, one thing that someone told me about grief is that it demands to be felt and you're going to feel it whether you decide to grieve now or grieve later. And it's the same with emotions. I've found that for folks who hold in anger for years and years and years or hold in bitterness, hold in sadness, it's like an overflowing dresser that you just keep stuffing in, you know, but it's, it's popping up all over and it bleeds into areas of our lives. And if we can prevent that in these generations, these younger generations, then I think there'll be a lot less conflict and a lot less numbing. And, you know, it's, it's definitely something that is going to take work. So again, my, and this is based on obviously not my personal experience, because again, no kids, but I have worked with kids in my practice and I've worked at children's hospitals, worked at um, you know, with families, with kids, and with substance use and mental health conditions in the family. So I do know that this stuff is important. So my suggestion coming from, again, someone who is a recovering number and someone who has seen how just conversation and asking someone how they're feeling can just change the trajectory of so many things. So first and foremost have a conversation about how they're feeling. It doesn't even have to be something formal like, hey, let's go sit in the living room and talk. No, it can literally just be on the way home. You know, you're asking them, how are you feeling? And let me give you my teenager response. I'm fine. Does that ring ring true for a lot of folks? Yeah. So they may be fine. Maybe that's true. But... This is one of those times where you have that opportunity to either sit with, okay, they're fine, or it can be a talking point where it's like, well, tell me what happened today. What made it fine? 
or, you know, whatever kind of rapport you have with your child or even asking like, with stuff going on in the news, you know, I, I know that there's a lot happening in our world right now and a lot of it can feel very scary. How are you feeling about that? And, you know, that just opens up a conversation right there. And then also encourage verbalizing how they're feeling in an age appropriate way. So again, you know, if they're old enough to look at the feelings wheel and be able to identify that, great. Um, you know, there are tons of books, I should have included them, but there are books that go into like things like feeling and the importance of labeling emotions. I know there's, what Disney movie was that? Or Pixar movie? Inside Out, was that it? Yeah, like see, there's even movies about it. <laughs> but you know, that's something you can bring out too and just have a conversation with that for kids that are that age. Also, don't be afraid to show your own emotions. The, you know, kids, they're sponges. Everything that we do, they are listening, they are watching, whether we think they are or not. And if they learn from a very young age, oh, like, my my dad, like, when he cries, he, he doesn't let anyone see. Or, you know, when, when mom gets angry, she she cries and then dad says, that's not okay. You know, these are the types of things that if they think they can't feel those, they're going to go through life like that. So showing folks that it's okay to feel, showing your kids it's okay to feel. And it doesn't have to be something big. Like, you know, there are obviously going to be times when major things happen when it's really important to talk about feelings. Like, for example, the death of a family member and talking about grief and what that means and really encouraging them to say how they feel. And then just openly tell your child how you are feeling, if, you know, and of course the teenagers in this world may say, mom, dad, don't make this weird. But, you know, I say, make this weird. Like, talk to them, say, you know, I, I have to say with everything going on in the news or with whatever happened in our family or with whatever is going on in our community, I feel very scared or I feel very hurt. I feel very fill in the blank. Um, and then ask them how they're feeling. You know, it's kind of like a you go first. <laughs> and that might be a good response if someone says, well, how are you feeling? Well, you know, you go first. And then <clears throat> remind your child or teen that feelings do play a very important role in telling us what's going on inside of us. And again, there's definitely a physical connection so oftentimes, you know, especially when kids are very young and they don't have the language for it, that's also a critical time because they can still recognize like what we're feeling and they still have feelings. They just can't verbalize it. So, you know, the younger that we start encouraging, um, you know, the feeling of feelings, then the more as they grow up, the emotional, just intelligence will, you know, help them, help friends, help the community. Um, I always say encourage I statements. It's really easy to say you, 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 you. It's really hard sometimes to say I, I feel this, I'm upset, I feel. And so just encouraging that and encouraging people to use their words. I feel like there's so much less violence, destruction, anger, what have you. If people just used I statements. Um, there's a lot of blaming in the world right now. There's a lot of shaming. There's a lot of all that. But it really isn't that hard to say, I feel this when this happens. And again, to model those for the people around us. And then a few little things that I know is already on y'all's mind. Set screen time limits, especially I think as teens, um, especially as the emotions are getting bigger because that's gonna become their escape. If they can't talk to you, they're gonna to talk to someone because emotions come out one way or the other. If they can't talk to you, they're gonna to talk to someone. Someone might be angry outside. <laughs> um, but yeah, talk to your child about addiction too. Don't just make it something that, oh, that's those people who, you know, over there. No, it's everyone. It's the person next to you. It's the person with a graduate degree that just tried it drug once. It's that person who grew up knowing that they could drink because it took away the pain of having to see their parents fight. It's everyone. Everyone has something. 
Um, and so just remind that it's okay to feel what you're feeling. You don't have to numb it. Um, and again, remind them that it's okay to feel. There's nothing wrong. And even tell them, like, when you are angry, when you feel this way, how, how can I help? What can I do to make this easier for you? Or what can I do? How can we address this? Um, and then really including them in the conversation. And then, you know, for those of us who are believers, give biblical examples of feelings, like the one with Jesus in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. I think that's, you know, a great one just to show, you know, Jesus felt this and it's so important that he felt this that they included it in the text. Like that right there says a lot. Um, and obviously there are many more, many more examples of saying, you know, be joyful, be, you know, anxious in nothing. And it doesn't say don't tell anyone that you're feeling anxious. It just says, you know, it, it acknowledges that we have those emotions. And it doesn't tell us, hide them. And then encourage emotional intelligence. And that would be the feelings wheel that you have in front of you, is to recognize what am I feeling? What are you feeling? And to really have like a tangible thing that you can look at. Oh, and if you lose your copy, it's literally feelingswheel.com. So <laughs> you can easily find it, I promise. Um, but yeah, it's a great tool to use.